Hello, welcome back to the Cash PT Lunch Hour podcast. This is Aaron LeBauer, your host. And today I've got an amazing uh, guest. Her name is Molly Galbraith from Lexington, Kentucky. She's the head woman in charge of Girls Gone Strong. And um, Molly is here to just share with us her journey of becoming an entrepreneur and uh, hopefully to inspire you guys to, um, I don't know, take the, get to the next level and step up. And I've been following Molly for a while and I was felt really lucky to have her respond to my message on Instagram and agree to come on the show. So Molly, thank you so much for joining us today. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. I am honored to be here and excited to talk to your community. Yeah, that's awesome. So I want to know a little bit like about you and share what you're doing um, with everyone so they kind of get some context and understand. So can you tell us like a little bit about like, because you're, you're in the fitness industry, fitness professional, you've got a website that helps women um, uh, feel healthy, get healthy, um, you know, move beyond some of the body image stuff and, and those things. So before I get into that, I, I guess before I get into that, I want to know like, how did you even like get here in the first place? Was there an event or something that happened growing up that you were like, I'm going to go into fitness and, you know, I'm going to go, you know, train people and do this thing. Is there something like back then that happened that like kickstarted you on this journey? So I'll give people like a brief little snippet of what we do now, and then I'll kind of back up okay. to, um, to how we got here. So Girls Come Strong is the largest educational platform providing evidence-based interdisciplinary body positive health fitness and nutrition information to women and to health and fitness professionals who work with women and so no this was not my career path whatsoever um, I actually joke that I didn't eat any food that wasn't beige until I was about 19 so I grew up eating you know pasta and grilled cheese and like macaroni and cheese and cheesy baked potatoes and just everything like beige and cheesy. That's what I, that's kind of what I grew up on. I was a competitive gymnast for five years, which is hilarious because I'm almost six feet tall, but I did that for five years. I was somewhat active in high school, end of high school, beginning of college. I got really sedentary. And in February of 2004, um, I realized I had gained a significant amount of weight and I wasn't feeling good. And, you know, it was kind of frustrating for me because I'm like, I like my job. I like school. I like my friends, uh, but I'm really unhappy with the way that my body looks and feels. And this is the thing that I have what feels like the most control over. So I decided I was going to get in shape and I hired a trainer at the gym. Uh, worked with him for about six weeks. As a poor college student, I couldn't afford to work with him much longer than that. But I kind of got bitten by the workout bug. And I had actually kind of oscillated between liking working out growing up. Like I had like exercise tapes and, you know, things like that. Mm -hmm. um, and also feeling kind of lazy and being, being pretty sedentary. But I really got bitten by the fitness bug. And so the end of 2004, I started dating a guy at the gym who was a trainer, which was much more economical. And uh, he was a competitive powerlifter and bodybuilder. So I was thrust into this world of intense exercise very quickly. And so by 2004, I was completely obsessed, just reading everything that I could get my hands on. I was all over online forums and, you know, really active and reading and chatting with people. And uh, so, and I knew at that point in time that I wanted to go into fitness. So I was in my junior year of college at that point. Um, and I did not want to switch my major. I'd switched my major several times that I was getting my master or I'm sorry, I was getting my undergrad in finance and marketing. Cause I always had kind of a business financial interest. And then, uh, so I kept doing that. And then I went on to get my master's in business. And shortly after that, I started my first fitness business. So girls come strong is gosh, probably my fourth fitness business. Um, the other ones either didn't do very well, or I ended up sell selling them to work on other things, but I've certainly always been entrepreneurial in spirit. But if you had asked me as a teenager growing up, I never would have imagined that I ended up in fitness. So yeah. I did a variety of things from 2000 and four until um, Girls Gone Strong was started in 2011. I competed in figure and powerlifting. I owned a brick and mortar gym. I had a seminar business. I had a failed uh, software, health and fitness software business. Um, and Girls Gone Strong was started in 2011. And in 2014, I sold my interest in my gym to my former business partner and went full-time Girls Gone Strong. And it's been quite a ride ever since. Wow, that's awesome. So the number one thing I took out of that is success is not an overnight. Yeah, not even close. And uh, not only is it not overnight, there are so many uh, failures that you have along the way, whether they're failures of your entire business or small failures within the business. Mm -hmm. I, I can see those now as learning experiences. It's really easy in hindsight to look back and think, 
all the time and effort that I put into helping build this, the health and fitness software business that didn't work out taught me so much and laid the groundwork for what I've been able to do with Girls Sound Strong. Um, and same thing, same thing with having a gym that taught me a lot. Same thing with having a seminar business that taught me a whole lot. But yeah, it's definitely not overnight. People are like, where do Girls Gone Strong come from? It's like, I've been here for almost 16 years, <laughs> 16 years now working in the fitness industry in some capacity. Yeah, that's great. So you were, you're in college, you're starting to work out. And then um, after college, was it like, hey, I'm going to go and do fitness or were you try, did you try to get a real job like I did? And did <laughs> uh, no, you know, I always felt, so I waited tables and bartended um, a bit and nannied and stuff like that in undergrad and then grad school. And right before grad school, I started dating a guy who was also very interested in fitness. And he had this idea for a health um, uh, and fitness software uh, company, which if um, it had actually worked when we had done it, it would have been absolutely revolutionary. Uh, I don't necessarily subscribe today to what we were trying to do back then because it was um very macro based meal plan like here's exactly what you eat down to the gram and here's how we calculate it based on these particular goals and how often you want to work out and things like that which is not necessarily my nutrition philosophy for most people today um, but it was it was pretty cool you input information about yourself and basically it spit out a customized nutrition and exercise program for you with all kinds of substitutions and grocery lists and all these things. This was back in 2006. So that would have been, again, absolutely revolutionary. Um, but as we eventually learned, if you build it, they will not automatically come. We right. totally thought we would build it and the internet would flood and we'd make all this money and help all these people and it would be amazing. Didn't happen. Um, but what happened was that we decided, my partner and I at the time decided that I would keep waiting tables, do the side hustle, make the money on the side and try to make this business work. And so essentially I finished grad school in 2007. I had been coaching some clients online and in person uh, waiting tables and bartending and went like working on this software business as much as I could did that for three years mm -hmm. and nothing was really happening. It took several years to actually build the software. Um, and then a friend of mine approached me and said he wanted me to help him start a, a, a boot camp business, which ended up over time turning into a brick and mortar gym about a year or so after that, uh, he wanted to start doing seminars um, called train like a girl where we, taught health and fitness professionals how to coach women. So at that time I was waiting tables, working on the software business, brick and mortar gym, wow. seminar business, started Girls Gone Strong, started blogging at that point and just had so much on my plate. Um, and so I just kind of slowly over time kept trying to figure out what's going to work for me. What am I going to be passionate about? What business can I create that's actually going to take off and not only help people, but support me financially. And it took a really long time to figure it out. Why, why didn't the, what, what do you think was the problem with the software business? Why did that fail? Why did that take so long for you to figure it out? Mm, um, so I definitely think a big part of the reason that it failed is we underestimated how important marketing was. Mm -hmm. um, we really thought that we could just build this thing and that we had some friends who, you know, were respected trainers in the industry and they could tell people about it, people would buy it. Um, but we didn't know anything. And again, you think marketing and a lot of people think advertising, but it was everything from the way the website looked to the navigation of the website to um, being able to clearly convey to people what it actually would do for them to not realizing that we might need to give people a free trial versus, you know, having them just pay for it right away. And um, we didn't know anything about any of that stuff. So that's number one. Number two, I don't think it's ever a good idea to try to start a software business uh, with limited capital, mm -hmm. um, at least for us. We had, you know, uh, an angel investment of um, a low six figure amount. They gave it to us. They said, if, um, if you never make the money back, you never have to pay us back. It was a pretty incredible opportunity. Um, but if you do make money back, then this is the percent that we want. But it just wasn't enough money. It wasn't even close to enough money. And we didn't realize. And sorry, number three, we started paying ourselves right away. So we started taking uh, distributions from the business because again, we were young, we didn't understand. We're like, well, I'm working hard, I wanna get paid. Um, and we did not make that same mistake with Girls Gone Strong, right. which has been a really big part of um, our ability to grow. And I'm happy to talk more about that. Okay. But I would say, yeah, so not understanding marketing, not having enough capital and, uh, and taking money out of the business right away were the three biggest reasons. Yeah, what would you do differently? Like, is, would you just reverse those things or is there something else you would do differently? If you did it over. 
Mm, yeah, I would say I would, I would definitely have a much deeper understanding of marketing. I'm not sure I would try to start the same business. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm not sure I would even take an investment. I'm a big fan of bootstrapping now. It, you know, I would probably try to find, it would be hard to bootstrap a software business. Um, and for people who aren't familiar with bootstrap, that's not getting an outside investment, but just, you know, being able to self fund what you're doing. Um, and then, yeah, I would leave, leave the money in the business so that it can be healthy right. and grow uh, instead of sucking all the money out. Yeah. So what did you do differently when you started Girls Gone Strong? Like, like, why did that hit so much, so hard that like, I mean, I heard about it four years, five years ago, you know, like it's big. It's like, the, you know, it's the largest uh, brand for, you know, <clears throat> educating women and people who train women. Like, why was that? Like, what was the thing that connected with people? Why was it? Yeah. So I think I'd be remiss not to mention how lucky we were to start something that the world was so ready for mm -hmm. at that point in time and being one of the first, you know, people often like, I want to start something like Girls Gone Strong. And it's like, that's cool. We were so lucky to be one of the first to start doing what we did. So you can't possibly, um, uh, I, I just can't say enough how important and lucky we were to be able to do that. So 2011, uh, seven women came together all to literally work out together and have some community and kind of fellowship time with each other. And we all realized that we were in our own little pockets of the fitness industry and we were all passionate about um, getting more women to strength training. And so it's like, well, I want to help women. I want to help women. I want to help women. And it's so funny because today it's like to find a, like a workout partner, another woman who's a workout partner or to um, find a community of other women who like to lift. It seems like, well, that's everywhere. Right. And at this point in time, it was so rare that we traveled from all over the world to get together. So mm -hmm. seven women came from Baltimore, uh, Salt Lake city, um, Chicago, Lexington. One woman came from Belfast, Northern Ireland, wow. all to get together to work out. And so we had this great weekend and we're like, this is this, we have this chemistry and this really organic like relationship. And so we decided to start a Facebook page because we didn't know what else to do. And on day one, we had a thousand uh, fans is what they were called at the time on our Facebook wow. page. Wow. Just kind of started snowballing. The first day that we launched our website, we had 17,000 visits on our website. And so certainly being first was a, was, a, was a really powerful thing, but it was filling a void, filling, seeing a need in the community, seeing mm -hmm. a hole, which I know that's something that you did with, you know, you've been able to do with your business as well is identify like, where's this gap that people might not even recognize, but you know, other people are feeling the same way you do or want the same things that you do. Right. And so it's like, as soon as you provide that solution for them, they start coming out of the woodwork saying like, that's me, that's me, that's me. Mm -hmm. I need your help. I have the same problem. And so we were able to provide a community that was based in, and again, we've evolved a lot since then, but it, the whole purpose of Girls Come Strong in the beginning was to preach the gospel of strength training to women. And so it was unique. It was timely. There were several women who came together. We all had our individual contacts with other fitness professionals and things. Um, a lot of the men in the industry who had big followings were super excited and, and got behind it and were thrilled to have a place because they felt like maybe they could tell their client something, but they wouldn't hear it the same way as if mm -hmm. they heard it from us. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, so it was, it was a lot of luck. It was a lot of passion and hard work, which I'm, you know, I'm sure we'll, we can probably talk a little bit more about as well. And a lot of, um, just, you know, right place, right time and, and having really good intentions about what we wanted to do. Right. Like we we're hoping to change women's lives through, you know, the same way our lives have been changed through strength training. That's awesome. So, I mean, you probably weren't the first to, I mean, maybe you were the first to think of it, but look, I mean, there's a, there's a reason that you're successful and whoever was like, Hey, I thought of that. And they're actually aren't a part of girls gone strong or even anything mm -hmm. similar. What's the, what's the difference maker? Tenacity, yeah. no questions asked. Um, Girls Gone Strong started in 2011. There were seven of us over the next several years. Each of the w other women who were associated with Girls Gone Strong ended up stepping away in some capacity. It just didn't work for their life or their business or their family or, you know, it wasn't making any money. Um, we did not monetize Girls Gone Strong until 2014. So we gave, 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 gave. Mm -hmm. You know, they're always like, give, give, ask, give, give, ask, right? And like we gave for three years straight to the point where people were 
begging us to have something to sell them wow. like apparel jewelry workout programs like anything and so um when we finally released our first training program in 2014 we sold six figures in 40 countries in a week period wow. um, because we had built up so much trust and we also turned down a lot of partnerships and things with other companies i don't think that's necessarily the right way to do it but for me i just wanted um i wanted to be 100% focused on Girls Come Strong. I didn't want to be focused on a partnership with someone else where there was an expectation that I would do certain things for, you know, it just, that just didn't feel right to me at the time. It allowed me to stay really laser focused. And it was hard. I was exhausted. I mean, again, between 2011, 2014, I still had my gym. I still had my seminar business. Mm -hmm. I had my own blog. I was waiting tables for part of that time. And uh, when my now business and life partner, Casey and I started dating, he um, he's an entrepreneur as well and again sure we'll get into that he's an entrepreneur he owns a brick and mortar sleep specialty shop they sell mattresses furniture um, all kinds of beautiful high-end sleep stuff and he said okay so you've got all these followers on facebook like how are you monetizing this and i was like we're not and he's like i'm sorry what <laughs> <laughs> like we're not and he's and so he started getting really interested he's like i need to learn more about this online game and so he started um, really digging in and, and being really helpful uh, in that capacity and kind of, um, he's really good at a lot of things that I'm not good at. So right. we make perfect partners in that particular way. But in addition to that, he came from a brick and mortar background, which is so helpful because when you build an online business, particularly if you don't have a strong business background, you sell, let's say $100,000, you're like, I made $100,000. No, 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 no your business just brought in a hundred thousand dollars, but there are all of these expenses that you're not thinking about. Um, you know, most brick and mortar businesses are excited to net profit five to 15% or whatever. Right. Mm -hmm. So coming from a brick and mortar background, he was able to offer a lot of uh, sage wisdom and advice about what it actually takes um, to, to build a business and you know, how big your expenses are and, and um, manage that kind of stuff, which right. was really helpful as well. So sheer tenacity, um, he, when we started dating, he's like, you would, you know, I would stay up till four o'clock in the morning, just getting a blog post out there when I had to be up at three, you know, I'm sorry, in three or four hours to go train clients, but it was just like literally whatever it takes to get it done. And I'm not interested in glorifying that hustle. Um, and certainly I don't necessarily, uh, it's certainly not, not healthy, um, physically right. or emotionally to do that. But for me at that point in my life, that's what it took to right to to keep it going well i i mean i don't know a single person that's had this level of success that you has that hasn't worked for it mm -hmm. right you know i mean you there is a point at which you have to hustle and then the point at which you have to start working smarter um and you still have to work i mean it's everyone thinks and this is a conversation that's happening in my communities in the last few months a little bit more it's like aaron i want to learn how to make passive income and i'm like great <laughs> you know it's not free and it's not easy you can certainly earn income when you're on vacation but it's but it, you know, it takes time and it's, it takes work and it takes sleepless nights and it takes like, it takes a drive. Wouldn't you agree to make it happen? Absolutely. And you know, I feel a little, um, uh, you know, a little uncomfortable, maybe tooting, tooting my own horn in that way. But I mean, I don't, I don't know anyone who, um, it, it, mm, I, don't say I don't know anyone. There are very few people I know who are willing to push themselves as hard as I have been willing to push myself in order to build the thing that I've built. That said, what I'm building is often different than what other people want to build. A lot of people want to have a solopreneurship or they want to have mm -hmm. you know, a, a clinic or a business or maybe they have one or two people that work for them or they have an assistant and maybe a part-time someone else. You know, Right now, it, w between Girls Gone Strong and uh, Wildcat Mattress, which is my uh, our brick and mortar store, they they fulfill all of Girls Gone Strong's physical product out of there. So they work for Girls Gone Strong as well. Uh, my partner and I oversee about 50 people. And so that's what I was interested in building. Um, and so for me, it definitely took that, uh, that hustle, that grind, that sacrifice. And I went into it understanding the trade-off. I knew I was sacrificing some of my health, some of my personal relationships, some of my, you know, my relationship with my partner, you know, certainly we had to pay attention to that shift. Um, but it's what, it was just something that had to live outside of my body and had right. to exist in the world. It's like, if I don't make this thing, I'll die. So, you know, which again, might be a little bit different than some people, but I've tried to be really cognizant of what I wanted to build, what it was going to take to do it. And also 
not always sitting around saying, well, things will get better when things will change when I've had to stop and say, okay, now I can calm down a little bit. Now I can make sure I'm prioritizing sleep. Now I can prioritize my self care because I didn't want to get caught up in the perpetual hustle and grind. I wanted to recognize the point at which my baby could essentially, you know, be okay if I, you know, wasn't um, kind of grinding as hard as I had been for so long. But you weren't with it all the time right mm -hmm, exactly <laughs> so how did you recognize that point where you were like okay i'm not going to be able to do this all on my own i need to start hiring people or outsourcing products or, or outsourcing work or finding other people to do things that i'm not good at yeah absolutely so obviously having my partner casey was really helpful and we started dating in 2013 um sold my uh, interest in my gym in february of 2014 released our first product in april of 2014 and like i said didn't touch any of that money, just reinvested it all back into Girls Gone Strong. I then started doing some coaching on my own to help support myself financially while being able to keep all of the all of the revenue within the business. And a few months later, we were just like still working, working, working hard. And I came home from a hair appointment and my hair was falling out. And I have Hashimoto's, I have autoimmune hypothyroidism and I have polycystic ovarian syndrome. So hair loss is a symptom of both of those, but that was not one that I'd really experienced before. And so I came home and I just had like this hair in my hands and I was crying to Casey mm -hmm. and he's like, we're not gonna do this anymore. He's like, we're not gonna stay holed up in our little townhouse in Lexington, Kentucky, all winter with you just like working yourself to death. And he's like, we're, let's, let's do something, let's go somewhere. And so at that point in time, there's a guy in um, the fitness industry named Jonathan Goodman. And he, similar to you being um, one of the first people really openly talking about cash-based PT, mm -hmm. he's one of the first talking about online training back in 2012 when everyone was like online training what's that you know and they thought it was ridiculous and he got laughed out of the room because everyone's like nobody's gonna want that people want to work with a coach in person um and so he and i were were you know knew each other through social media but didn't you know weren't super familiar with one another and i knew that he had spent the last couple winters traveling in hawaii and thailand and so i hopped on a phone call with him and i was like hey how did you go to hawaii for not a lot of money <laughs> because at that point in time, again, we still didn't have um, mm -hmm. a ton of revenue. And he said, well, Allison and I are gonna be in Uruguay if you wanna come. And we're like, okay. And 20 minutes later, we booked tickets to Uruguay. That's and awesome. so for, uh, for us, and we ended up spending seven weeks there, for us, it was not just about um, taking that bit of time away from work because we worked the whole time we were there, but it was also about we knew John knew so much about the fitness space, about the online space, about uh, fitness business in general that we didn't know. For us, it was also about doing literally whatever it takes to make Girls Gone Strong work. Mm -hmm. And at that point in time, it was hopping a plane to Uruguay and spending seven weeks with somebody that we hadn't met in person so that, and living with them. We ended up living in an off the grid home, 25 minute, a 25 minute walk to get water every single day, um, wow. just to literally do whatever, whatever it takes to make it work. That's awesome. So here's what I really want to know is what has lit the fire in you that makes you so passionate about Girls Gone Strong and helping other people that's keeping you up at night, pulling your hair out, literally, and making all these sacrifices and changes um, and not just rolling over and being like, I'm done. Like, what is the thing that, that keeps you up at night so that you keep going with all this? Yeah, so I come from a long line of activists, actually. So uh, my grandmother marched with Dr. Martin Luther King. Um, my other grandmother was a volunteer and sat by the bedside of AIDS patients in the 80s when nobody else would touch them. Um, my mom sold fair trade products for women in Central America whose husbands and brothers had gone missing. Um, my parents housed El Salvadorian <laughs> refugees seeking political asylum. My father is considered one of the grandfathers of the industrial hemp and medical marijuana movement in, um, uh, in the country. He was, uh, was preaching about it in 1977. Again, in Kentucky in 1977, talking about those things is not necessarily popular. Um, and so I have just seen role modeled for me my entire life, what it means to do meaningful work that creates a better world for other people. And so 
I think that combined with also growing up uh, not having a lot of money. So believe it or not, so my dad as an activist, he was also a politician. So he ran for governor unsuccessfully five times in the state wow. of Kentucky, as well as a number of other things. And, uh, and so we didn't have a lot of money growing up because being an unsuccessful politician doesn't pay very well. <laughs> um, my mom went back to school as a single mom of three girls when she was seven, went back to, or when I was seven, she went back to law school. And so we grew up without a lot of money. Um, and with this like just innate drive to, um, to do meaningful work that changes people's lives. And so I think for me, uh, I didn't know it at the time. I just knew I love this industry so much. I love this information so much. This is such a big part of my life. I want to do something in this industry. So I didn't necessarily know what I would do. And I don't think I necessarily set out with the intention of changing the world. Mm -hmm. But again, with hindsight, always being 2020, you look back and you say, okay, like this is where this came from. Um, and I've always been very financially savvy. So when I was seven, my dad uh, borrowed money from me for the first time. And he borrowed, I don't know, 20 bucks or hundred bucks or something. And I was like, sure, dad, you can borrow the money, but if you have it and I don't, I should get something for it because what if I want to buy something and I don't have it? That's not fair. And he's like, baby, what you're talking about is called interest and I'd be happy to pay you. So at seven years old, I had this idea in my mind that I have money. I'm going to give it to someone else. They're going to have it. So I should get something for it. So I just have always been uh, really strong, like had a strong sense of numbers and finances and things like that. And so I think growing up poor, not ever wanting to, grow up within that scarcity, having utilities shut off and, you know, not having money to go on a field trip or to buy food or things like that, not ever wanting that. And then seeing this activism role model that all kind of converged in this, um, this, you know, this way with the Girls Gone Strong organization and my drive and passion to, to do that work. Wow, that's awesome. That's amazing. So what is it about Girls Gone Strong that's so fulfilling to you? Like, what are the, like, things that you're doing or, what are the ways you're helping people? Like, why is it that, like, what is it about it that feeds this cycle that has you keep coming back for more? Yeah, absolutely. So again, I've, uh, over time, we've evolved from, um, you know, preaching the gospel of strength training to women to one of our highest values is autonomy. Another one of our highest values is making a difference. And when I think about the work that I do, fitness feels like the vessel through which mm -hmm. I try to create an environment in which uh, women particularly feel safe, feel comfortable, feel strong and capable, feel resilient and feel autonomous and in charge of their bodies. I think it's so clear all over the world, women are vastly underserved. There's, there are so many inequities um, between women and men all over the globe from you know, um, family planning to, uh, to um, you know, the way that like women in agriculture and business and all of these things, there are so many inequities. And I feel like, you know, we have a global movement of women in, in 80 countries around the world. And so I feel like even with all of these other inequities that are happening, there are so many ways in which women are so consumed with the way that their bodies look mm -hmm. that they don't even have the headspace and the energy to think about doing great things with their lives. They're so consumed with the size of their thighs. They can't even do this other meaningful work that they were probably put here to do. And so for me, Girls Come Strong, when we're working with women on an individual level is about creating the space where they feel safe and comfortable and strong and capable and resilient and autonomous. And then once they do that and they realize how powerful they really are and they stop thinking about the size of their thighs and realize their power and their capability, they can step in and do the work that they were meant to do in the world. And health and fitness professionals, we spend more time with our clients than just about anybody else, any but other member of their healthcare team. And so we're on the front lines of critical conversations about self-care and rehab and nutrition and exercise um, and autonomy. And so I think that we can make such an impact on these women's lives and then they can turn around. Cause again, once it happens, they're like, my life changed now mm -hmm. I want to do it. Um, so a lot of the women that enroll in our coaching certifications, for example, started out as fitness enthusiasts who loved our information, had their lives changed by Girls Gone Strong, and now they want to turn around and pass it on. So it's really like body liberation, autonomy, equity, like it's all at the core of what we do. But the exciting thing is 
if you talk about that stuff, you only reach a tiny portion of people. Mm -hmm. But if you're like, hey, we got kettlebell swings and uh, <laughs> you know back squats and pull ups over here, people are like, yes, I want to know more about that. Right. You know, so it's it's cool. We have a really um, popular or exciting or sexy, I guess, vessel through which we can do the work that we do. That's awesome. That's really powerful. That's really that's really awesome. So thank I mean, you. you. Should be like super stoked and proud. Like if this ended today, that you've helped as many people as you have. So thank you. Um, I want to know while we're on that topic, I want to know, like for other women who are business owners and entrepreneurs, what are some of the things that you struggled with as a female business owner? And what would you either say to yourself back then or to the other people who are like, you know, I can't do it. I don't want to do it. I don't know if I can, but they have a great idea. They, they, they have, um, they, they know there's something out there for them, but they're unable to. I don't know, take that next step, you know, like, I don't know exactly what it is, because I'm, I'm not a woman. But I want to know, like, because I have a lot of women, listen, a lot of women, the physical therapy industry is majority women. And someone mm -hmm. even posted on one of my posts on Instagram yesterday, is like, we're all the, we're the women. I'm like, right. So there's something that's different happening. I want to know, like, what was your experience? And what would, what would be your advice to someone who has this idea that I got to like own a business and change the world myself, but I don't know what to do or how to do it. I don't know the question. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, I'm no, I, I totally, I totally hear you. And uh, it's an interesting answer because they don't, these particular things that I see a lot of women struggle with are not things that I've struggled with so much in my business, but more in my personal life. Mm -hmm. um, but I see women struggling with it in business so much. And uh, number one is self doubt. So there's, um, really interesting. I was just listening to the book Moment of Lift by Melinda French Gates. And she said that there's evidence to show that women will only apply for a job if they believe they meet 100% of the qualifications needed to get that job, where men will apply for the job if they meet, I think, 40 to 60% of the qualifications for that job. And so I think that, you know, and, and women are so... Um, uh, we tend to have a lot more self-doubt, I think, in, in general than men. We tend to think that we're not as qualified. I mean, women are constantly um, saying that they, who am I to do X, Y, and Z, right? Who am I to own a business? Who am I to be on this podcast talking to Aaron? I'm not a PT, you know, like, why would he want me to be on the podcast? I don't have anything to share with his community. I think a lot of women struggle with self-doubt. And, you know, there's also some really um, interesting kind of social conditioning that we see. So there's, uh, we see about 4,000 to 10,000 images a day. And there's a media scholar named Jean Kilborn who says that we only process 8% of the images that we see consciously. We process the other 92% subconsciously. And everywhere women look, just about, we're underrepresented, particularly in places where important decisions are made, whether that's the boardroom or the city council or higher levels of politics or on panels at conferences. Like I'm often the only woman at these fitness conferences. And so if there's, or if there's like 40 speakers, there might be three women, right? So it's easy to look at the lineup and say, oh, well, there's only a couple spaces there for women. So like I might, might as well not even, not even apply. And there is a precursor to that, that at least in the fitness industry, there are fewer women who have been in the industry as long um, as a lot of the men in the industry. There's maybe a handful of women who have been here for 30, 30 years, mm -hmm. and there's significant, and if you're looking at percentage wise, right, there's a much higher percentage of men who've been in fitness for 30 years. So yes, at certain points in time, there have been more men who have been qualified to be the ones on the panel, right? But when we see that, and that's all you see all day long, well, then you might not even enter the industry because you think there's not enough women in there, or you might not stick around because it doesn't feel like a safe environment for you, or you feel like you're going to have to assimilate into a culture you're uncomfortable with because it's male dominated and you don't like it. So you end up leaving the industry early, right? There are all of these reasons why there are fewer women in these spaces and it's self-perpetuating because when we see fewer women in the spaces, we think there are fewer spaces left for us. Mm -hmm. But so it's understanding that um, you, we have to overcome the self-doubt. We have to realize that we're good enough. We have to realize that we're qualified. We have to realize that we have something to offer. And we also have to realize it's okay if we don't know something. I told you ahead of time, you know, before the podcast, if you ask me a question and I'm not an expert in it, I'm just gonna say, I don't really know, or that's not, that's not my area of expertise. Um, 
and that's okay. We don't have to be perfect. Um, you know, there's a reason Brene Brown's work has exploded when she talks about the gifts of imperfection. So many women, we feel like we have to be 10 times better than someone else in order to be taken seriously, because that's actually what the data shows in terms mm -hmm. of, you know, to be taken seriously in workspaces and things like that. So I think there are a lot of reasons for it, but self-doubt certainly being one, and just feeling like, um, we're good enough and that we belong in these spaces and that we have what it takes to do the thing. Um, and finally, uh, there's a lot of evidence to show that women take on significantly more of the domestic work um, than men do. And so this is like, you know, taking care of the kids and the laundry and the cooking and the cleaning and all these things. Even if we're not doing it, we're thinking about it and organizing it and in charge of it. Um, same thing in, in Moment of Lift, Melinda Gates talks about how there is no country in the world where the unpaid domestic labor of men and women is equal. And in some countries, it's as high as five hours a day. I think India, where men are doing 30 minutes a day. In the U.S., women are doing about four hours a day to men's two and a half. So you think about that extra hour and a half compounded over time every single week. That's 10 and a half hours a week. That's 42 hours a month. Like, if women were able to spend 42 hours a month, or even let's make it equal, right? They were able to spend one less hour a day, mm -hmm. an extra 28 to 30 hours a week working on their business, that would create so much time and space for them to be able to do the work that they want to do in the world. So right. a lot of uh, a lot of big, big cans of worms that, that I just opened there. But I think that's really powerful as well as, um, you know, speaking to their partner about maybe the equity within their relationship and how much work they're doing and maybe how some of the load could be lightened so they have more time and space to start their business. Yeah, that's awesome. So you feel like it's, it's kind of a, it's, it's less of a business issue and more of a, you know, a self uh, confidence empowerment issue mm -hmm. that comes through society that for probably a lot of people is being solved by going out and lifting some heavy shit. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Right. I mean, so many women talk about that. They talk about, you know, how it's, it's lifting weights, for example, it's such a tangible example of how you get better at something over time. Um, so you walk and you think you can't deadlift 135 pounds and then you do. And then eventually it's 185 and eventually it's 225. And it's like, now I can do anything. Um, yeah. They feel so good. And also they see that practicing these particular skills over time add up to being able to do a lot more, which I think is really powerful as well. So I think women are, I mean, just absolutely as capable as men to start their own business, but I definitely think there's a lot of self-doubt. There's a lot of fear of messing up, fear of making mistakes, um, fear of, you know, appearing imperfect or embarrassing themselves, not being good enough, and then clear inequities and in unpaid domestic work right. in, in most partnerships where, um, you know, there's a, a man and a woman. I, I didn't get the data on um, on partnerships, same-sex partnerships, but, it, you know, there's partnership between uh, a man and a woman. There's clear to, um, inequity right. in the unpaid labor. What are the, I mean, what are the things that you've done to overcome that? Because clearly, like, you you have, you know, and, and a lot of my guests on the podcast, I mean, they've, they've overcome it, whether we've talked about it or not, but, like, what have you done to, like, I mean, clearly, like, you're, there's something that, that you've done, like, you're working on yourself, making sure that you've got the confidence or mm -hmm. like, you know, maybe, you, you, you know, we all don't feel like we have it. Like some days I'm like, well, I don't have, I don't have what it takes to, mm -hmm. we all struggle with that stuff, but what have you done specifically to overcome this or to take a next step to make sure that you're the one who like took the good idea and filled the void where it was missing and made it work? Mm -hmm. So a couple of things, um, and one of them is something that other people can do, and the other two, I think, are kind of innate. Um, so the first two that are innate is um, my audaciousness and my naivete. So I'm, I am a really, I can be a really naive person, and I can be um, really, what's the word? Like I'm not good at picking up on signals around me I'm, and I'm just kind of like, like never really, I'm assuming the best of people all the time. Like we'll leave a conversation and, and Casey, my partner's like, man, you know, they did not like when you said X, Y, and Z. And I'm like, really? I had no idea. <laughs> I didn't notice that at all. Um, and so I'm just like always just really generous in my assumptions of people. I assume good things about them. I assume people like me, you know, I'm just like, I just really have this like naive, audacious personality. When I, um, I was off Facebook for a couple of years when I got back on in 2010 and I started seeing all these fitness people that I had um, been reading their work online, I started being like, 
Dan John, I want to be friends with Dan John, add friend, like no idea that that might be inappropriate, that I didn't know him, that I should maybe introduce myself first. And I literally built this massive network of fitness professionals on Facebook simply by not realizing that just friending them without sending them any message or knowing them was completely inappropriate. And that I should probably at least introduce myself first. So I've kind of got that going for me on that side, number one. Um, on the other side, the thing that other people can do is I've been in therapy for, gosh, 12 years now. So I started going back in uh, early 2008 um, when my then partner told me that uh, he felt like that I couldn't be vulnerable with him. Mm -hmm. And so now the joke is that therapy worked too well because now I'm vulnerable on the internet um, and actually cry on, on, video, on video podcasts with people. Um, but that has been huge for me. And I have gone consistently for the last um, 12 years. So people will go for a little while and take time off. I haven't. I've gone um, and just really built um, an incredible uh, kind of emotional resilience where now I'm like, okay, cool. So like people don't think I'm good at my job. Like that sucks. Oh, well, guess I'm not for them, you know, or like people don't believe in me or um, there are a couple things that people can, can do or say that kind of get to me these days, but it's really few and far between um, yeah. but going to therapy on a regular basis has allowed me to build the emotional resilience just to be like, cool, I can handle anything that comes my way. Um, and that's been really, really powerful for me to trust myself to be able to handle whatever's thrown. That's at. awesome. Cause yeah, the internet is, can be a cruel place, <laughs> you know, and I don't, mm -hmm. I, I know I don't even get half of what, you know, the, the women that I'm friends with get. And even like, so I was a massage therapist, my wife's a massage therapist. Like, I don't, I don't think I, I think I had like one sexually inappropriate encounter in 20 years and she could she couldn't count them on her hand you know and and a lot of it is um how you carry yourself but it's also you know <clears throat> as you're getting used to it and how many people see it, and, and women just guys are stupid and <laughs> but the internet's cruel like these people weren't cruel like the internet's cruel how do you i mean is 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 this like how you handle like building this emotional resiliency how you handle that or is there some other way that you like handle like the internet trolls and the internet haters and people that like, <laughs> just try to be really mean and behind their, hiding behind their computer mm -hmm. um one of the really beautiful things about girls gone strong is because we have led so strongly with our values we've built this incredible community of really positive like-minded uplifting mm -hmm. people and create are very intentional to create those spaces so i joke with my friends that every once in a while when i look outside the girls so strong bubble i'm like ah i don't want to i don't want to go out there um but I did in 2016, in the beginning of 2016, I had a post go mega viral and it reached 440 million people worldwide. It was shared by everybody, Zoe Deschanel, Ashton Kutcher, George Takai, The Today Show, Cosmopolitan, People Magazine, like it was covered everywhere on a bazillion media outlets. And um, so when I first posted on my Facebook page, you know, all these comments were like really, really nice, right? Because there was everybody who followed me. And then it was like friends of people who followed me. So that was pretty nice. And then it started, you know, you start like getting the kind of the concentric circles. And then it's like, whew, all the trolls come in and just mm -hmm. like, are just coming for me. And I mean, I was called a slut and a whore and a told I was fat. And then I eat too many carbs and I'm an embarrassment to women and all these kinds of things. So it was a picture of me in a bathing suit and long story short, I was just kind of talking about my body acceptance journey and how like, you know, today, the only um, person I care who likes my body is me. And like, I feel really good. And so, um, and, you know, an attention whore. And like, if you really liked yourself, you wouldn't have to tell people about all this kind of stuff. And so um, for me, I've been able to realize a, a friend of mine at the time named Aaron Brown said, people only have to give what they have inside of them. And that has been such a just like, just amazing perspective shifter. So like when I see someone spewing venom or hate, I'm just like, wow, that's what they have to give inside of them. Like that's mm -hmm. tough. You know what I mean? Like I wonder what they've experienced for that to be the only thing that they have to right. share or give. Um, you know, I'm like who literally spends their time like being mean to people on the internet? <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm just kind of like, okay, like you would never knock on someone's door and be like, you're ugly and like right. run away. But that's what people do on the internet. So I think that perspective shift that people have to give what they have inside of them has been um, 
has been really powerful for me and just realizing like, I'm not going to be for everybody, you know? So, and, and the way they feel about me, I think is their problem and not mine. Um, so I think that's interesting. And another kind of little social experiment that I realized is that based on where, um, who shared the article and what the first couple comments were, the rest of the comments just about would mirror the first comment. So if the first comments were like, Oh my gosh, you're so inspirational and amazing. 90% of the comments would be that. And if the first one was like, who does she think she is? So it's just this really interesting, like, um, really interesting thing to see people conforming to what they think uh, other people are going to say and do. Um, so yeah, it's just kind of like, you know, that's their problem, yeah. not mine. Like, I don't know these people, they don't affect my life. You know, um, if they're, if I felt like their comment could, was a learning opportunity, I would use it as a learning opportunity. And I was pretty much always really kind back to people, even when they were really hateful. Cause yeah. I, I've come to the, come to realize in my personal life, actually interacting with real humans, even if people are unkind to me, if I'm kind back, like, you know, kind of, it ends up just kind of winning out in the end. Yeah. Like, you know, so. Yeah, I know. I mean, I think I saw that post. <laughs> I'm sure I did. I mean, you know. <laughs> but I think, you know, but I know it's just like, it's when you put yourself out there, there are people that are just going to comment on it and they're going to hate it. And, and a lot of people are afraid to put themselves out there because they don't want to get the hate. Mm -hmm. You know, they don't want to get the pushback and they don't want to get, you know, they, you know, like one of my fears is that people won't like me. I don't like it when people disagree with me, even though I'm fairly opinionated, but it's like, I think that stops people from taking action and sharing, which. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Brene Brown also talks about how um, she talks about the man in the arena. I think it's a Franklin Roosevelt quote where she talks mm -hmm. about like, like, unless you have been in the middle of the arena face down, you know, marred with dust, like, you know, like those are the only, uh, those are the opinions that I take seriously. Like if you're sitting up in the cheap right. seat, throwing stuff at the people who are down in the arena, actually doing something like, I don't, I don't pay attention to your opinion, but if you're down here with me and you know what it's like, because again, there are so few people who do that, who know what it's like mm -hmm. to try to create something or birth something into the world or whatever, who spend their time talking about or bringing down other people. Most of us are just so laser focused on what we're doing. We're like, cool, like hope it works out for them, you know, um, right. and just kind of have our blinders on and get back to what we're doing. So it's like, you know, the weight of, it's, it's very important, I think, to consider the source of where this information is coming. It can be harder if it's friends or family or loved ones or whatever, but which certainly happens as well. My mom told me at one point that my entrepreneurial efforts reminded her a lot of my grandfather and my dad, both of whom were failed on, essentially failed <laughs> entrepreneurs. Um, but I just was like, cool, prove you wrong. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. I'm just going to keep going. So that's awesome. Um, I want to pivot a little bit. Uh, those are really important messages to share. So thank you. Um, I want to know a little bit, like you mentioned before, like you've got a, you've been working with some physical therapists. Um, shout out to my friend, Anne. Uh, Ann Wendell, who started with you guys a while back, and that's how I learned about you, but also you guys have created like a pelvic health course, and so clearly like you advocate for physical therapy, so what's the, what's your story with physical therapy, and then can you tell us a little bit about what you're doing and how you're partnering with physical therapists to change people's lives? Yeah, absolutely. So when I took over Girls Gone Strong in 2014, I'm a certified strength and conditioning specialist through the National Strength and Conditioning Association. Um, I realized that my skill set is, you know, is limited, right, in the, in the grand scope of women's health and fitness. And so I wanted to bring on experts who had expertise in different areas. And I um, really had my life changed by physical therapy in 2010. I had been training for powerlifting, not getting a lot stronger, drove up to Indianapolis to see a coach named Mike Robertson. And he worked really closely with a physical therapist named Bill Hartman. And so for the next three or four years, I would drive from Lexington to Indianapolis to work with Mike and Bill on a really regular basis. In 2012, I injured my back in the gym, started having chronic back pain, had chronic back pain for two years and worked with a number of physical therapists who really changed my life. And I think, um, so being around Mike and Bill and a bunch of other physical therapists, uh, I realized, how smart and talented the physical therapists that I was around were, but also I felt like PTs in my experience did such an incredible job of knowing what was within their scope of practice, knowing when to refer out, such use such conservative management strategies for people who are in pain or, you know, they're not just going to, you know, send them into surgery, right? There are so many options. And I realized so many people's, you know, injuries or um, pain or like 
problems that they were having within their body could be treated or at least mitigated in some capacity with physical therapy. And so I've just had such a great experience working with PTs and I really love the information that they've been able to provide on Girls Gone Strong. So about two or three years ago, when we created our first certification, it's our pre and postnatal coaching certification. We brought 16 women together and six of them were physio physiotherapists. And so five of them specialize in pelvic health. And uh, yeah, I've just had, I've realized how wonderful it can be when you take this interdisciplinary approach because PTs are so talented, coaches and trainers are so talented, um, OBGYNs, midwives, doulas, like there's so many people who can be part of a woman's um, healthcare team that when everybody works together, knows what their scope of practice is, has an abundance mindset in terms of, you know, working with this client or patient um, and can improve outcomes significantly with their clients and patients. It just doesn't make sense not to, um, not to have that network and not to uh, understand and respect and be willing to refer your clients and patients back and forth to other members of, of a woman's healthcare team so that again, I mean, you, you know, you're all about improved patient outcomes, right? Like there's the reason that you don't work for insurance companies, you work for the patient. I feel really similarly with the interdisciplinary approach that we take, we can improve outcomes so much. And um, again, allows everybody to stay within their scope of practice. So I'm just super passionate about, um, about bringing together all uh, members of a woman's healthcare team to, um, to talk to each other and listen to each other and uh, learn from one another. That's awesome. That's cool. So you guys have, have used that to create your content and you're creating courses for what, like other trainers or, or like just the general, you know, Jane public or, you know, yeah, so we have we do courses for both, but we have um, several courses for health and fitness professionals. So one that we created recently was What You Must Know About Pelvic Health, Your Ultimate Guide to Working with Pregnant and Postpartum Clients. Oh, and so we're talking about all about pelvic health because it is such a critical part of women's overall health. Mm -hmm. And it has been kind of that area has been understudied and under talked about for so long. Um, I have friends who are PTs who didn't even know pelvic health physical therapy was a branch of physical therapy until about a year or two ago. And it, it's, you know, it, it, women are having poor experiences. There's been some research that shows that 45 to 50% of active women experience leaking some type of incontinence or leaking urine when, when they're in the gym. 30% of women are still having painful sex at a year postpartum. And up to 19% of women will have surgery or pelvic organ prolapse or incontinence at some point in their life, and 30% of them have to have multiple surgeries. And here's the thing, <laughs> like those can often be treated or at least mitigated with physical therapy. And so for coaches to understand the role of a physical therapist and for physical therapists to understand the role of a coach or understand the role of a physical therapist who does a different branch of physical therapy than they do is so critical and important. So we put together this pelvic health course and it informs health and fitness professionals, whether they're a physio or a, um, or a trainer or coach or nutritionist or um, someone who works with women in some healthcare capacity, it informs them about pelvic health, helps them recognize uh, what to do if a woman's having symptoms, what they can do within their scope of practice, when it's important to refer out. The coolest thing is the course teaches them how to build a relationship with other health and fitness professionals. So oh, it, awesome. we provide templates for, for example, if I were a coach wanting to create a relationship with you and we'd never met before, mm -hmm. we have a template letter that I can send over to you that I just enter some information, my name, your name, et cetera, that basically tells you like, hey, I'm really excited about what you do. I've heard great things about you. I'd love to start referring my clients to you when they have you know, issues with X, Y, and Z. Like, I'd love to bring coffee by your office sometime if you want to meet or you know, whatever. So you can actually establish that relationship with other professionals. Um, That's so, cool. Yeah. You know, because a lot of people, like a lot of trainers are like, well, oh, you're going to take my people away from me. <laughs> you know, it's like, or, or vice versa. You know, they're, they're afraid to send people to PT. And, you know, my mindset is, you know, I want to work myself out of a job. I want people to train with you more often. But I mean, that happens is you guys address that. And is there like the way, like a number one way that you would want someone to approach you? You know, would want someone to approach me or <laughs> like, well, let's say you, would, you address that in the course, right? You address like mm -hmm. how to contact. So like, let's say you were actually still training clients and I was still seeing patients. <laughs> And I want to come say, hey, Molly, we should, you know, like, what would I say to you as a physical therapist to say, hey, 
you know, not like send me all your injured patients. Like what are the best ways for someone to approach, you know, strength and conditioning specialists, mm -hmm. personal trainers, et cetera, the fitness community, you know, in a way to build this partnership. Cause I think that's, yeah. You know, so if, if you are a physical therapist, I think one of the best things that you can do is volunteer to give some type of talk at a gym and just say, Hey, I've got a lot of great information about your clients uh, or, you know, that I could be able to share with your clients specific, specifically if it's about pelvic health, because so many of them have, um, deal with those issues, but just say, Hey, I want to educate either your staff or, or do a free, um, kind of chat for your clients about X, Y, and Z related to their the health problems they might be having. And just kind of show that like you have a different area of expertise that you can be really helpful with. Um, for coaches, I think it's music to our ears to hear that you only want to see our clients a, a few number of times and get them back into the gym as quickly as possible. Um, I think that there are, again, certain experiences that, that maybe trainers have had with PTs who want someone to come, you know, three times a week for six weeks or something like that, when really they probably could have done um, what they needed to do in three or four sessions, but right. saying like, hey, I'm a PT, this is what I specialize in, this is what I'm really good at. If your clients are feeling good, if they're pain-free, if they're this in their body, they're going to be more likely to stay with you and keep working with you longer. It's my goal to have, you know, your clients be my patients for as short of a time as possible. If you want to send people to me, that would be awesome. I'll get them, I'll work with you closely to make sure that they can still work out and do things that they enjoy doing in the gym, but that are aligned with the treatment protocol that, you know, me and that patient have come up with to treat whatever issue that they're having. Um, and then, you know, I'm happy to, once my clients start, or once my patients start feeling better, if they're looking for a trainer who I know is well-versed in keeping clients safe, healthy, and strong, I'd love to send them your way. Yeah. Um, I think that's a really powerful way for trainers to see kind of that symbiotic relationship. Right. And again, we have um, communication templates, like letter templates within the course for physical therapists who want to work with coaches as well. Oh, that's awesome. Is um, So you said, like you had mentioned, there was a, a Free. Is this the free course or is this the, mm. wow. Okay. Yeah. It's, <laughs> it's a free five day course. It comes with, um, uh, five days worth of content. It comes with video content. You can download the transcript. If you prefer to read, you can listen to the audio and we actually have what we call a podcast version of the audio where we string all five days of the audio together in one listen. So people can listen to that as well. Um, and then we have all of these downloadable free resources. Like I said, the communication templates, we have what we call a um, stop, caution, go guide where, okay, um, if your client's feeling this, you need to stop. If your client's feeling this, you use caution. If your client's feeling this, you go. Um, here's how you modify exercises if they're having particular symptoms. Here are the options you use. So we do everything we can to make sure that we're not just spewing information at people, but we're actually making it transformative and giving them actionable tools that they can implement as soon as they're done with the course to start seeing improvements in their um in their pt practice or in their coaching practice wow that's awesome so i'll just you send me the link and i'll put it in the show notes and if you're listening and you want access to the free course just go over to the blog show notes and it'll be there that's so dope um molly that sounds really like really powerful oh uh, mm -hmm. wow that's awesome so i got like a, a probably a million other questions but I, I think we got a ton of good stuff like i I guess the two last questions I have for you is what question did I not ask you that you think people would, um, you know, get something out of? Like, mm -hmm. My number one thing that I tell people who want to start their own business. And again, I obviously have a lot to say about business, but the, the, the business side, the finance, the strategy, the marketing, the accounting, the legal, my partner knows a lot of that. I do mostly mission, vision, content, and voice. But the number one piece of advice I give someone when they want to start um, their business is to keep their personal expenses low. So, and it's not sexy advice. And I used to hear my partner, Casey, give this to people all the time. And I was like, why is he so obsessed with that? I don't understand. And now I have come to realize, Girls Gone Strong would not be where it is today if we had not kept our personal expenses incredibly low. On Friday, a few days ago, we just moved out of the townhouse that we moved in together when we started dating back in 2013. It is under power lines. It is next to a train. Like it is not a great part of town. Um, Casey and I share a car. We share a, a 13 year old um, Toyota Camry. Uh, we like have just 
I mean, kept our personal expenses low and been able to keep everything in the business. And it has allowed us to weather storms that there's no way we would have been able to weather had we not done that. It's allowed us to make really cool decisions, um, aggressive decisions. It's allowed us to make massive mistakes and be able to bounce back from them. It's allowed us to just do things that we would have never been able to do. Um, had we not kept our personal expenses really low and kept as much of the revenue in the business as possible. So number one thing, like I know it's fun to see people on Instagram, like, you know, on their yacht in Santorini or whatever, but it's like, I mean, like I said, we started this business eight and a half, over eight years ago just now when, when again we moved into a two bedroom apartment like we still didn't move into a house we still didn't buy a house like we live in a two bedroom apartment and girls come strong is you know doing multiple seven figures and we've had the business for eight years um because we just want to keep reinvesting back into girls come strong because it's allowed us to do some really powerful things so um be patient keep going believe that you can do it keep your personal expenses low and uh, and and keep you know keep giving back to your business for a really long time and it will eventually get back to you too. That's awesome. So what's next for um, Molly and Girls Gone Strong? Yeah, so the last several years we've been in um, serious research and development. You can see behind me, that's a 500 page textbook and a uh, 600, I don't know, yeah, there we go. 500 page textbook and a 600 page textbook. Um, so we've been just massive R&D phase, writing these uh, evidence-based interdisciplinary um, comprehensive textbooks for health and fitness professionals who work with women. So now we feel like we've really leveled up that game and now we're circling back around and leveling up everything else. So working on um, rebranding our website, working on um, improving our closed Facebook groups. We have a closed Facebook group for health and fitness professionals called GGS Coaching and Training Women. It's got 25,000 uh, health and fitness professionals in there, and it's people of all disciplines um, who are currently professionals or want to be professionals. Um, so we're leveling up, you know, even how we're running our Facebook groups. We're working on leveling up our social media. Basically, those things are like the absolute gold standard for anybody who works with women in any capacity. But everything else has had to kind of stay status quo for now. So now we're circling around and leveling up everything that is customer facing or community facing to be as quality as our certifications. So wow. social media, branding, marketing, Facebook groups, all that kind of stuff. So just, you know, one thing at a time. <laughs> that's awesome. That's really cool. That's, that's so great. I'm so happy Thank for you. your success. I mean, this is great and you're impacting so many people. It's, it's Thank you. I mean, I'm excited because I know how incredible those things are, but if you go to our social media, you might not get the idea that like, oh, this is the most world-class well-researched information, or you go to our website and it's like, you can't quite tell um, yet because we haven't had the opportunity to kind of bring all of that stuff along. Um, so I'll be really excited for it to be incredibly uh, obvious what we do at Girls Gun Strong and how we help people in all of our um, you know, community facing materials. I'll be very, very excited for that. That's awesome. If, uh, before we head out, if someone wants to get in touch with you or follow you or find you online, where, what's the best place for them to go? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, I, I kind of maintain my own social media and stuff apart from Girls Gone Strong. So we've got our Girls Gone Strong website. Um, the GGS Coaching and Training Women Facebook group is one of the best places if you actually want to get in touch with me and you have a question for me because you can tag me in a post in that group and I, I try to get in there and answer every single day. You can follow um, Girls Gone Strong on Instagram at the Girls Gone Strong and I'm at the Molly Galbraith on Instagram as well. So I would definitely say Girls Gone Strong website, GGS Coaching and Training Women Facebook group and then Instagram at the Girls Gone Strong and at the Molly Galbraith. So awesome. All right, Molly, thank you so much. This is like you dropped some serious knowledge bombs, shared some amazing stuff, and um, you're, you're kicking some butt. So I appreciate you um, being here to share your knowledge with us because the the more we experience, the more I get to interview people like you, you know, the more some of the success rubs off and these clues. So thank you. I appreciate it. Well, thank you so much for having me and thank you for the work you're doing. I love that you're putting patients first in your practice and you're teaching other PTs how to do the same. It is no secret that uh, a lot of our healthcare systems are very broken and people aren't getting the help that they need. As someone who's experienced chronic pain and has been helped significantly by cash-based PDs, I say thank you for the work that you do and the work that you're helping other people do. Uh, again, I think we can have a massive impact on people's lives and overall health. So thanks for having me. And um, yeah, hopefully we can chat again soon.
Absolutely, absolutely. So thank you so much. And so this is a Cash PG Lunch Hour. This is Aaron LeBauer, Molly Galbraith. And if you got anything from this episode, I would 100% appreciate you, you know, share it as a five-star rating review on iTunes or screenshot this, shout us out on Instagram and let us know what you learned, what you got out of, uh, got out of the show and share it with your friends and uh, check the show notes for the resources that we mentioned. And we'll see you on the next show. 